My name is Dr. Rochelle Newton. I say this often. I am my ancestors' wildest dream. Yet to myself, I wonder where I am and where I belong. I promised God many years ago I would do something for someone every day of my life, and I have tried to do that. But in the current climate of our world, it seems like that we are more confused than we've ever been. There is not a lot of understanding of what's happening to us and why now. Why did the death of Mr. Floyd bring such a change when black and brown people have been killed every day since they first came to this country? Why now? So I found this page and I said, I wanted to share it with you. You probably already know, but in case you don't. George Floyd. Rihanna Taylor. Atiana Jefferson. Aura Rosa. Stefan Clark. Botham Jean. Philandro Castile. Alton Sterling. Michelle Zezel. Freddie Gray. Janisha Fonville. Eric Garner. Aki Gurley. Gabrielle Nevare. Tamir Rice. Michael Brown. Tanisha Anderson. And there are many more, more names than I know. I talk about Mr. Bird, who died in Texas in 1998. We have Rodney King. We have famous people being harassed and roughed up by the police. I grew up in a little town in South Carolina called Walterboro, not far from Charleston. I was born in Brooklyn, New York in Kings County Hospital. I was raised by my paternal aunt, Alberta Newton Edwards. She had one son, he was hearing impaired and he was in a school for those with hearing impairments. I lived with her. She had a fourth grade education. She was domestic. She cleaned floors for white folks on her hands and knees. Many days I went and sat on the back porch while she did this, so I would be safe. I think I've told you this before, but my husband gave me a new perspective on the tough love that she gave me. She was saving my life. My life has meaning and purpose. I just don't know for sure what that is. I did not get my first college degree until I was 45 years old. I started in IT information technology when I was 17, 18 years old, 1977. I don't even know what that is. Um, and over time, I grew in the field, you know, made certain advances, made a little more money and all of that. But I never did believe that that, that is what God had as my destiny. So when I went to college, I went to North Carolina Central University here in Durham. 
and uh, I had two majors, literature and psychology. But it was my literature teacher who actually gave me the gift of learning and wanting to learn and know more. She saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. And her desire to see me achieve, she was an Indian woman, was more paternal than anything I knew. Because my mother died on December 2nd, 1977. My biological mother still lives, but she did not raise me. My biological father died. My stepfather, Lemma Jim, or Harry Kennedy, died. So I was a child in the world of, alone, and I had a child of my own. And I had no idea what I was doing most days, but I did my very best that I could. In 1993, I met, I met Elston Enrico Brown, or as his friends know him, Skip. In a lot of ways, he saved my life again because he gave me perspective. A husband is not a person to have peaks and valleys. He's very flat, very stable, very conscientious in everything that he does. We have two children, both adults now. I've wanted to teach ever since that day that professor saw something in me. It's what changed my direction. After I got my two graduate degrees, undergraduate degrees in two and a half years, near the top of my class, I went back and I got an executive master in public administration. And as you listen to this, you'll never hear me say I got any type of degree in information technology. Because if you've worked in IT for any length of time, you know it just builds on what was the original. And I had come in in the 70s where mainframe computers and all these kinds of technologies were just beginning to uh, take flight. IBM was the main thing. They, they had most of the, the field. There were other companies, Hewlett Packard and some others, Sun uh, Microsystems. There were other companies who were doing great things too, but, but I, IBM was the dominant player in the game. Um, and so I learned and continued to learn about IT. It didn't seem relevant to me to get a degree in information technology because most of it you could figure out a little bit. I did everything. I was a programmer. I was a network manager. I, I create operating centers. Um, as a project manager, I was a manager, I was director, you know, all of those kinds of things. And I grew and I learned. It was a predominantly white male thing. Growing up in Walterboro, South Carolina, hearing the N-word was not an unusual thing. It was a more reasonable accommodation. People called to that all the time. And to stay alive, you never reacted to that. You just kept on going. You see grown men called boy. You see women disrespected in the streets. So when I got to IT, I faced the same thing. I remember my first job I was a punch card operator, so I would get these long trays of punch cards and have to carry them from one place to the other and get them into the computer, get them into the system so they could be fed into the computer and you know, create an output. And there were three white men that did something else. I don't know what they did, but they would see me struggle with these punch cards. And I mean, the punch card was probably about three or four feet long and maybe about a foot wide and the cars were in there in an order because it actually contained the data that it was going to push up to the mainframe and uh one day uh as they were passing me by they started calling me the n-word and pushing and poking at me well of course you know that meant i dropped the punch card tray and i thought i had lost my career at that time, but fortunately someone else had dropped it before, so they were used to it being dropped and they knew how to reorder the cards again. So there was that. Um, I was not stopped, call, I was no longer called the N-word in my 40s. Um, 
I experience microaggressions even today. Um, you know, people say things to me that I'm supposed to be okay with. And um, I haven't often been called the angry black woman because I am a true introvert and I don't particularly enjoy conversation or interacting with people. I prefer to be quiet in my room reading or whatever it is that I'm doing, but interaction with people is not among my fun, my fun things. As I grew older, so many things happened to me. You know, I, I think I told you this before I was raped at 19 in broad daylight. Um, I have had so many cars repossessed. I probably own a car lot now if I could tell you how many because I had no idea what credit was. I had no idea the, the logic of paying your bills because my fourth grade mother and my Walter High School education was lacking. So I didn't have a foundation. And I had a child to raise that I didn't even know how to do that. And then as I've gone on, I have learned to temper my emotions and feelings and ideas and thoughts. I'm always contributing. I build my network. I have a massive network. I connect people to each other all the time. And I just recently started an organization to look at advocacy. And advocacy more than just saying, you know, hey, this is what I went through or this is how I did it. But to actually be a voice for those who don't have a voice, who do not have a voice. My diversity chats in my YouTube channel came from an idea someone else had given me, but it has paid dividends many times over. People ask me now, especially white people, what should I say? What should I do? My first answer in my mind, I want to say is, why haven't you seen this for 400 plus years? But that's not the right answer. So I ask, talk to people who look like you and don't look like you. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them what they need. Ask them, how can I help? Because while we are great at collaboration and talking to each other, I don't think we really know how to bridge the gap that racism, Jim Crow, slavery, Holocaust, um, Islamic threats and, and wars. And I don't think we know how to bridge the gap to talk to each other and see the differences in each other as beautiful things as opposed to reasons to hate one another. If my skin is lighter than someone's, it doesn't make me any better than theirs. Um, if someone's hair is blonde, it doesn't make it better than someone's who's brunette. But for some reason, we've allowed so many constructs to become a part of our national anthem. White is better. Black is not. Why? Because I believe people need to feel better about themselves. And in order to do that, they have to put someone else down. I think that we as a people have got to learn to communicate with each other, to see each other as human beings. Just like we can tell the difference between a beagle and a German shepherd, we ought to be able to tell the difference between a black and a white person and see them both as humans. Because both that beagle and that German shepherd are dogs. The black person, the brown person, the yellow person, the white person, and whatever other kind of person it is, is a human being. We need to see them as human beings and treat them as such. I have a very vast network of friends of all races, creeds, colors, everything you can think, gay, straight, whatever. I don't think that it matters the external characteristics of a human being. It matters the internal characteristics of a human being. To have a heart, to care to think about someone other than yourself, to do something for someone other than yourself. 
the names I read to you, I probably mispronounced them. I'm going old and see now in this time now, but the fact that so many people die of police brutality, black on black crime, white on black crime, white on white crime, brown on brown crime, 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 crime. Why are there so many guns in America? Why do we need a gun that can shoot 20, 50 bullets at one time? Blah, 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 blah. Why? I mean, even if you're shooting at a deer, shooting him that many times, it won't be very good deer meat to eat. So why? Why do we need to use deadly force to address an issue that can be de-escalated with just conversation? One of my favorite things to do is watch crime crime reality shows. And I find myself always concerned about it because when they talk about the person who's committed the crime, whether he's killed one person or more, they describe him as a monster or pure evil. Well then, if that is the case, that that person is a monster or a pure evil, what are the people who oppress black people kill black people, brown people, hang us from trees, beat us with whips, deny us an education, separate us, segregate us, deny us. Aren't they pure evil? Isn't that a monster? Or is it just a monster when the person is black or brown? I leave this question with you, for you to ponder. I am not perfect. I do not strive to be perfect. I do not have any inclination to be perfect. I strive to be human. I strive to be kind. I strive to give whatever I can. Why can't you?